Welcome back to this week's uh, special theme focus here in LTCC Teaching and Learning. And this week we are focusing on Accessibility Week, or as I call it, asterisk every week is Accessibility Week. Um, and the reason I say this is just like if we have a Diversity Week or Equity Week of Celebration, we realize that all weeks of the year should be focused on diversity. All weeks of the year, in this case, should be focused on creating student accessibility and helping students with disabilities. And I really wanted to create this focus this week. I've been meaning to do it. And with the opening of the new SAS, which is formerly the Disability Resource Center and is now Student Accessibility Services, on Friday, as I'll show you, I had a chance to visit the new location in E106. I really encourage you to go and check it out. So there was the great timing of that happening. There were also some online uh, conversations about alt text and how to do alt text with images and tables and so forth, so it's good timing for that. And then because we're doing this Accessibility Week next week, uh, we're having a series of events. So I really encourage you to check out my information I'm sending out this week. If you're watching this video later, you can watch those two archive videos. We have Teaching Talk 68 coming up with Michael Miguel, focused on Canvas tips and tricks that are really handy at the beginning of the quarter. And we also have a special focus on students with disabilities and creating accessibility in our classes the accommodation forum kelly will be there for teaching talk 69 talking about accessibility from that perspective of how to do the accommodations in our classes and michael miguel will be there as well to answer any of your questions about accessibility inside of canvas so as i was putting this together i tried to use here just a chart to really lay out my thoughts on accessibility I'll give you a lot of different perspectives here. And first thing to say is I'm not trained as an accessibility specialist. Um, and I actually think that's good because that'll give some indication of maybe a typical faculty perspective or staff perspective as it comes to issues of accessibility. What do I know in terms of Canvas? Am I aware of all the immersive technology out there to make uh, learning accessible for all of our students, whether they are sight, hearing, or cognitively impaired? And also think about, do I know about the services that the SAS provides? Am I aware of opportunities through our curriculum process, the curriculum committee, and um, all the folks working on curriculum, including uh, Justin, if you had a chance to meet him, our new interim curriculum specialist, all the stuff that goes on at the level of curriculum approval to make sure that our processes are accessible, that we are creating classes that can reach all students regardless of their backgrounds. The same thing can be said here of Area D under POKER. POKER is our peer online course review process, and there's an extensive section talking about all the tips that we need to follow, it's the law of course, to make sure that our content side of Canvas is accessible. So for example, make sure we don't have multicolored headers um, that can present challenges to screen readers or maybe even immersive readers. So important to know all this stuff. So in giving you my personal perspective and faculty perspective on this, I'm coming at it not as a specialist in learning disabilities, but as someone who knows that every week of the year that I'm teaching or dedicating my services here as FCTL and the TNL program, that I need to make sure that I'm doing everything I possibly can to meet our students, their needs, and to help all of you um, as instructors. And the one thing also that occurred to me this week is I can always improve, you know, and I encourage any of you out there, uh, if you have suggestions for improvement, you know, come by my office. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Sometimes on email, um, it's hard to have a good conversation, whether it's about accessibility issues or other topics. So let's talk about this. And I would challenge you, just as I'm saying, I absolutely need to do more to immerse myself in understanding the law, in understanding the services that SAS provides, in understanding what happens in curriculum and Canvas and YouTube and all these other technologies. I encourage all of you to take that same perspective critically. Regardless of who you are, regardless of what you teach, you always have something new to learn and to offer to our students. And it's so important this week as we launch the special TNL theme week on a student accessibility that we all take a very critical and humble perspective in terms of our understandings of accessibility issues. This is not one of those gotcha kind of things. So if you have a class in Canvas and you forgot to do something or you're not aware of a particular header that you should use or not use because you haven't seen the information, that's why I'm here, that's why the rest of us are here, that's why Kelly and Beth and Nicole and others in SAS are here. It's not a gotcha kind of moment to say, uh, you pass the test and your class is fully accessible, 
but this person over here, they missed a few points and so therefore they're bad or they're not caring as a teacher or instructor or trainer or whatever. So I really want to make that clear because the only way we're going to be successful is if we, if we apply grace with each other as colleagues here at the college and we really focus on grace in terms of trying to meet the needs of every single student. Okay, so on this outline, I'm just going to take you through these different topics. Again, it's just my, whatever you want to call it, idiosyncratic or unique way of looking at issues. And what I'm hoping is some of you, whether it's Beth Kelly, Nicole, or others in the SAS, when I miss stuff, or Michael Miguel, if I miss stuff in Canvas, jump in in our trainings this week, send me an email. I can update this. I have some very um, minimal resource links here, but I think they're important in terms of looking at some of the accessibility issues. I always say with accessibility, and any aspect of teaching and trying to meet our students' needs, it's really akin to what Walt Disney said of all places of Disneyland. And actually Disneyland and the theme park industry um, have, have really had to adapt to not just legislation, but growing needs of people, perhaps needs of people with cognitive disabilities that we don't think about. Sometimes someone is perfectly able to see, but their cognitive abilities are challenged. Um, and this came up recently with uh, a particular disability of Chris Rock related to the controversy with Will Smith during the Oscars and another medical conditions there, condition there with Jada Pinkett Smith. So it's actually been in the news quite a bit, but you know what happens at Disneyland is this notion that it's never finished. They're always thinking of ways to improve. And I really encourage us to take that kind of approach as we talk about these issues with accessibility. We're never done because there's a new technology that comes out. There are new medical conditions and disabilities that arise every day of the week, really. We know this with COVID, with long COVID symptoms. We know this with mental health right now coming out of the pandemic um, and all the other crises that we've been dealing with here in the United States and across the world. Okay, I thought we'd begin this week talking about um, the great thing that's that's uh, around the corner, and this is the uh, redevelopment on campus that has led to new spaces opening up. And indeed, now in E106, we have the student accessibility services. I'm saying the, trying to get used to that. I know it used to be the uh, Disability Resource Center. It's now student accessibility services, so no the um, in front of it. It'll probably take me uh, a little bit of time to get used to that, maybe like you, because I'm, I'm so used to saying uh, DRC, Disability Resource Center. So definitely a big deal here. Uh, we've all been going through the construction. Some of you more than I have. My office hasn't been displaced. I was actually checking out some of the construction progress and actually had the chance to go to the SAS opening here on Friday. And it was really cool actually to see some of the progress going on. If you've had a chance to see what's going to be the one stop, it's a major you know construction project. I know the board this coming week will be touring um, and getting an update on on this construction process. I know, for example, that the Promise Office is uh, really taking shape. It looks amazing. They have this huddle space and all the computers and stuff, and I think it's going to be a really cool place for all our uh, Promise Peer Navigators to meet, our Promise Director Antonio and others, and it's just really great to see these spaces, you know, coming um, into play here. And I, I'm just surprised at how quickly, to me, it seems quick. Maybe to you it doesn't. I wasn't displaced, of course, other than having to move around those spaces and uh, avoid the construction zone. But this is the new SAS, so I encourage you to check it out. It's an E106, and during this construction process, you're gonna have to go all the way outside the building. So you almost have to start from where we enter near the library, and then just follow to the university center, and then fork around by the theater there, and then go through the double doors and take your first left. When you take that first left, you go down the hallway, you'll see all the construction, and then it's really the first accessible or open door or on the left as you walk through that hallway. So um, I don't know a lot about the exact services here, so I want to leave that to Kelly, Nicole, and Beth to talk about, but you can see they have a bank of computers here. In the back room, Kelly, and I was there with Kata, we had a chance to um, attend the opening together. They are going to make this very cool space that has yoga mats, and it looks like very alternative kind of approaches to relaxation spaces. 
as I'll get into with my example at the end, my personal stories, this is really amazing. I've worked with some folks who do palliative care, uh, care for people uh, near the end of their life, for people with terminal diseases, people who are trying to work with uh, individuals who have disabilities or cognitive impairments. And often you look towards this alternative kind of approach when you create spaces. You want those spaces to be comfortable. Sometimes you do that through sonic techniques, through lighting. There's a lot of different techniques I would love to talk to you, all of you about um, in the immersive world that uh, in the immersive worlds out there that we can actually employ. So this is really cool to see that they're doing kind of this alternative approach and I'll, I'll love to see that space once it's uh, complete. This is the uh, door as you enter. I didn't take a ton of pictures. You see there's still construction stuff going on. They have a, uh, I believe this room right here is testing. And then this is the um, welcome desk. Again, the computer bank is kind of to the right there. And you see the sign, student accessibility services. Here's their information with their times. And just to the left here, you can't see it, will be Kelly's office and Beth's office. And so if you ever need to connect with them, that's right there. Again, I really hope you go by sometime. Uh, check out their office hours and make sure that you see when they're open. But they are open for full services for our students. So that's super exciting because when you have that available to students, I think the drop-in ability is just so much better than having to do this virtually. They still do this, of course, on Cranium Cafe as well for any of our students that might not be able to come to campus. So definitely check out E106. It's really exciting. I love the fact that the college has thought about from a planning perspective. And I have to acknowledge Al Frangioni. Al, good luck in your new endeavors. Uh, you've been absolutely amazing uh, to work with on campus. We've had uh, quite a few cool conversations about spatial design and, and uh, talking back and forth a little bit about um, some different approaches. So I certainly will miss Al. Um, as he moves on to his new adventures, but he was such a huge part of this project. But I love the fact that in the planning of this, everything is integrated. So you have pr the Promise Office, as I showed you there, just down the hall, kind of on the left there, and then you're going to have all the counselor offices and Michelle Batista and everyone else in that one-stop area. So it's really cool that all the student services are integrated in this one area. It makes it so easy. Uh, it's great for students with disabilities. And one of the things I've discovered working with two close family members who have needed wheelchairs and walkers, um, assisted care inside the home, assisted care in a memory care facility is, you take for granted so much as a so-called able-bodied person walking around, like you think it's no problem for me to walk from the parking lot into school. I challenge you to do that in a walker. I challenge you to do that in a wheelchair. I challenge you to do that with a cane. Um, I've experienced this firsthand and I'll tell you like it is, it is a huge task. It is a huge challenge. If you don't have layout of spaces going back to the theme park industry, one of the things that designers do very carefully is really planned for accommodating guests with disabilities to make sure that all the spaces are accessible. When you discover that spaces aren't accessible, um, then you realize that something really does need to be done. So the fact that the college has thought about consistency and integration of all the services in one area is brilliant. It's important not just for accessibility, but also just makes sense from a planning perspective of students trying to use those services. So check out E106, our new SAS. Throughout the week, we'll talk more about aspects of what is offered through SAS. And again, I'm really trying to leave that, of course, to the folks at SAS. But one of the other things I'm trying to do is to really bring out awareness of issues and say, we've got to be doing more, myself included. All of us need to be doing more in terms of meeting the needs of our students with um, accessibility needs. So if you want to get to the accessibility, the SAS website, go to our uh, main ltc.edu website, click on S or type SAS, click on that. And then in the search, you'll see it's the first one that pops up. So this is everything that you really need. It has all the information about the services, the philosophy, all the personnel here. If you need to connect with a staff member in Cranium Cafe, that information is there. You can also click on information related to uh, students. There are proctoring forms, there are requests, accommodation forms for uh, information for new students. There's a checklist. It's it's really well done here. I like that everything is, is laid out in such a, um, you know, very clear manner in terms of being able to read this. This defines all the services and it also talks about California Education Code. So again, this is the law. It's not something that we just do because of course we wanna help our students, but it's also the law. So we have to be really aware of that. Um, 
This talks about verification of disability, and I think some of this Kelly will be going through in our workshop coming up on Tuesday, so be sure to check that out or check out the video. This has all the services that are available. It tells you just the different um, things. Um, this is kind of cool. So the Zen Den, I believe, is that space. It has a calming sensory experience to reduce stress. So that, I think, is that space with the yoga mats. That's really cool. It reminds me of, um, there are quite a few airports. I want to say SFO has this. They have a yoga room right next to um, one of their chapels that they have. And you go in the yoga room, and it's really quiet. There's calming music. You can lie down on a yoga mat. You could do yoga, whatever. And uh, I'll tell you, we all need it. It's, it's one of those things that's really great when you travel, and in this case, it's great for our students that need these services to de-stress, to meditate, to decompress, practice mental and emotional wellness. I, I totally love that we're thinking about that in the redesign of our, our spaces on campus, including SAS. Here are the forums that you can check out. And then I believe we'll talk about this a little more, but uh, Kelly did a video some time ago, and it was specifically talking about the new Disability Resource Center guide. Of course, now it's the SAS Faculty Guide. This was before the name change. This is what it looks like. And if you're interested in that, um, I know that we can uh, get you a, a copy of that. Um, I have those available. And then I was just pulling it up here. Um, if you go to the guide, and again, we can we can talk about this if you don't have a copy. This was updated in spring 2022. It's really comprehensive, and if you want really what this is all about, I encourage you, check out the video online if you can't find it, let me know. That was Teaching Talk 49. That's another reason I number these, because you can say, oh, 49 was the one where Kelly talked about the SAS guide, or in those days, the DRC guide. So check that out. It's really full-fledged and comprehensive. <music> Again, in terms of the workshops, I'll mention these now as well. Um, we had the talk on the SAS guide. We also had one in which uh, both Treva and Kelly talked about students with disabilities. The note-taking note -taking technology glean that Kelly talks about, this was all the way back in Teaching Talk 14, ages ago, seems like, now that we're, we're close to number 70 here. We don't any longer have Glean. So I just wanted to make that clear because you might look for that. We don't subscribe to that service anymore, but if we do get a new note-taking service for our students, we'll let you know. Kelly, Beth, Nicole, others will, will let you know. I also have a video on Zoom transcription. We'll talk about Zoom in, in just a little bit. So these are the workshops we've done. I encourage you to attend the two teaching talks this week, 68 and 69. We'll get into a lot more of these issues. Bring your questions. I would love to go through any questions you have, as would Michael Miguel and Kelly Greiner. So I want to mention a little bit here with our curriculum process. In the old days, the DE addendum was reviewed by the Distance Education Technology Committee. I was on that committee. I served two terms as interim DE coordinator. I believe now the addendum is being approved and reviewed by the curriculum committee. I don't know if that official information has gone out, so I don't want to like um, jump the gun on that. I think that's the case. As uh, D Justin Danchemon comes on board, welcome him. He's an amazing uh, faculty member in religious studies and humanities, uh, knows a ton about teaching and technology. So you can talk to him about teaching, pedagogy, as well as curriculum. So Justin will be involved here as our new interim curriculum specialist, the position held previously by Terry, and then Kenya. Kenya's now moved into a new position. Uh, and of course, uh, Terry has retired a few years back. So the one thing I wanna point out is under the old DE addendum, there was a section on the uh, DRC approval and the fact that your class had to be compatible with all our requirements, whether those are Canvas or um, Americans with Disability Act uh, guidelines, laws, etc. So I'm going to leave that like a little bit out there just to say like, you know, this form might be changing. I know some processes are changing with the curriculum committee. I can refer you to the current chair is Brian Yarian. You can also talk to Michelle Risden, who of course is the uh, CIO and sits on curriculum committee. You can also talk to Justin, but that's another uh, step in the process by we establish some checks and balances, if you will, to make sure that we're doing everything we have to do legally and then everything we need to do empathically to make sure that our students are all able to access our classes. So I'll leave the curriculum piece out there for now.
Um, next, you know, let me talk about, I'll, I'll get to Canvas just a little longer. Let me just mention with YouTube and Zoom. So one of the cool things about YouTube, if you go to youtube.com, and I'll just pick up one of my videos here, out of the menu, you're going to see my browsing history here. It looks like I'm looking at a lot of cat videos and progressive rock videos. So there you go. Um, as well as MBA videos. You kind of know my, my lifestyle here, just looking at my uh, video feed. But let me look at one of my uh, uh, recent videos and I'll pick one that has some um, text behind it, if you will. So one of the things YouTube does, and I will say does quite well, is it captions your videos automatically. So let's look at this. And what I'm going to do for this, if you ever go to YouTube, and please talk to me if you have any YouTube questions. Um, I am uh, yeah, somewhat obsessed with YouTube. I use it quite a bit. And you can see right now, watch what's happening on the screen. Okay, now it is, it was playing some music. So it actually had in uh, parentheses there in brackets that it was playing music. So if you listen to this, I don't know if we can pick this up. It could be an in-person class, but for most of us, it's probably a distance education class, um, maybe a discussion board where a controversial topic comes up. Um, I can imagine now with the war in Ukraine that there could be conflicts in a class if some people had different opinions on, I mean, it seems very one-sided. It seems like most people in the world and religious political organizations are all, you know, condemning uh, Putin and what Russia is. I wanted to show you this because if you watch that transcript I was as I was speaking, it was 100% accurate. And I think people are, are a little unaware of how amazing the voice recognition technology is. When I show you some of the alt text tagging technologies, it's astonishing what artificial intelligence and machine learning can do in terms of picking up text, going from speech to text, and also um, doing this with, with alt tags. And I show you this because I, I heard in the past people saying like there were captioning issues with YouTube. And I just want to state that the stock caption that YouTube does for you, in my estimation, is in the upper 90s, really close to 99, if not 100%. Here's the one thing you're going to notice. It didn't capitalize Putin in this case. It put an uh in there. And I say uh, as, as maybe many of you do when you're speaking. It also didn't do some of the punctuation. So one of the things you can do if you have a video, particularly if it's short, a video that is very easy to work with. And again, I really encourage you to all think very carefully about doing captioning and alt tagging because it's very complex. As we get into with alt text, um, it is not an easy matter figuring out exactly how to give text to an image or how to describe an, Im an image using text. It might seem really easy and something you just do, it's actually not. And the same thing I would say about captioning, there's a lot to learn here and appreciate. So one of the things you can do is go to your edit screen. And this is of course, if you have a YouTube account, I have a YouTube account with all these videos I use, click on the subtitles. What YouTube is going to show here is, I can hit the duplicate and edit and continue. And this is um, going to overwrite my existing draft. I'm not going to save this. This is the entire text right here of everything I said. I don't know if I want to see this. I'm like, oh man, I, I talk a lot. But I was kind of giving a quasi lecture. So here's what I could do here is I could hit copy. And then let me open my favorite word processing. I'll just open Microsoft Word. So I just use the um, you know command or Apple C on the keyboard, and then I'll open up a blank document, and then I'm going to hit paste. Check that out. I have my entire caption. This is created by YouTube, and as you can see, well, let's jump to the topic today then, and we'll talk about. So today's topic is specifically focused on dealing with challenging student discussions, dealing with challenging students. It could be an in-person class. One of the things you actually discover in doing this is that. Um, you know, your, your patterns of speech are almost brought to the surface and it could be for good or bad reasons if you say a lot of uhs or ohs or ums right here. And that can actually be useful. Sorry, I was trying to highlight an um. There it is. And that can be useful if you're actually practicing a speech. I really encourage you to experiment. I'm always using on my phone, which is just right there, dictation. So I dictate into the phone. The accuracy is amazing. I often use that for Canvas grading. I think Michael McGowan in the future will have 
a video focused on using the, the Canvas app. Maybe you could do your, your grading in that using dictation technology. But this shows you everything you said and YouTube transcribed this. I did not do a thing here. I talked and this is what resulted. So very easily here, one of the things I like about editing uh, your captions right now is if you have your spelling or grammar preferences set up, you immediately have flagged all the punctuation or not punctuation, capitalization issues. So check this out. Putin would be capitalized. My joke is I'd like to do a strikeout on his name because he's a fairly bad dude, in my opinion. Um, so Russian, Ukraine is not capitalized. Justin was talking. And then here's Solange. And check this out. So it got Solange's name correctly. So what I've discovered is Dave Chappelle. I was talking about Dave Chappelle. I don't know how Dave Chappelle came up in a... Uh, well, actually, I do. We were talking about controversial discussions. And uh, well, let's just say Dave Chappelle has gotten into some trouble making very transphobic uh, comments. Joe Rogan, right, has gotten into trouble over uh, uh, spreading misinformation about COVID. Um, I'm just showing you this because if you look at this, these are all the captions, if you will, subtitles that it didn't get correct. So all I do on this is hit this and hit uh, the capital version. Now, the next part is a little more involved. So this is what you would start doing. You would start capitalizing and you could, I guess, decide on how correct you want to be with punctuation. It, it, it's interesting. Again, I'm not an expert on adaptive technology. I could try this out though. I'm wondering if I put well, I think very typically I would put a comma after that if I'm writing that as an email or in a text of some sort. My question often is, how do things vary with a reader if you don't have punctuation? Actually, we can do that right now. Let's, let's check this out. We're prototyping, as I say. So if you want to do this in Word to get a sense of what this will be like, just type um, speak or speech, read aloud. So check this out. I'm turning up the volume. Well, let's jump to the topic today then and we'll talk about... Okay, so I think you heard the pause. So it knows a comma inserts a slight couple millisecond pause there. So let's try it without. Well, let's jump to the topic today then. So see, it, it, it does affect the cadence. Um, and we all, of course, speak in ways with, with rhythm, rhythm and cadence. And so having that in is pretty important. So let's try this sentence, if you will. Let me see. Maybe it ends there. Again, I could possibly start the sentence with maybe... You see right now what I'm getting at when we talk about alt text later. We think it's a simple thing of simply typing a transcript. If I want to preserve the conversational approach here, I might take out the uhs, but then the question becomes, if the uh is being spoken in the video for someone who is hearing impaired, will it be important to have the uh? So this is where you get into kind of this prescriptive versus descriptive with linguistics where it's like, well, what exactly should be the right version of this? So I would say use your own judgment, but for me, let me start this sentence without the punctuation. Well, let's jump to the topic today then and we'll talk about so today's topic is specifically focusing on dealing with challenging student discussions, dealing with challenging students. It could be an in-person class, but for most of us, it's probably a distance education class, maybe a discussion board. So you saw at the period there, it put that pause just like with the comma. So what I have to do here, and sometimes we speak, of course, not in complete sentences. And this is the challenge with creating subtitles. When actors do this, of course, they can do multiple takes or iterations of their dialogue to, quote, get it right. When we speak sometimes off the cuff like this, we're not making complete sentences. So if I say, let's jump to the topic today, then, and I would probably put a comma there and we'll talk about, okay, so again, it kind of goes into so, um, and I'd have to go back to that to see if there was another word in there. It kind of reads strange. So I guess I could put a comma there. Again, this is not going to be perfect because I'm saying it in such a way that it's not grammatically correct. And that's what happens when we speak. So it's it's one of the challenges of doing any kind of transcription where you're dealing with real text, if you will, that was spoken extemporaneously. I did a ton of, I took a class actually on transcription, on musical transcription, but we transcribed lyrics. I've done interviews with people and I really struggle when I do interviews uh, about the verbatim issue. Like I just said, uh, there. So if you say, uh, in an interview, you typically would take that out if it's a print interview, but if it's on video or on audio, it's there. So I guess you get into this issue of how prescriptive should you be. And I will leave that to the experts because I know there's a lot of debate about how to do captioning and subtitles. So you could do that in, entirely in Word and then paste it back in here. Or you could actually do it here. 
And this is very amazing. Check out the bottom. So it does it by the section of the video. So check that out. It's showing you on screen the caption and it does it really well in terms of the contrast there. It's got the white text on top of the black. And then down here, you can edit and go in and change those. And that's what's really amazing about this is you can edit it inside here and get them right, change the punctuation, fix the capitalization. It says here you can pause while typing. And you can also use all these keyboard shortcuts here that allows you to nudge the playlist. Um, it allows you to pause or play the video. So if you're doing this, you know, in real try time and trying to type this and, and, and keep up with it, this allows you almost like in the old days of stenography machines with the pedals, rewind, stop, pause, go forward. Stenog stenography is absolutely amazing, by the way, when people do this. Same thing with dictation machines. You could start and stop the cassette recorder. I used to use these at the Archives of Traditional Music for our musical transcriptions and lyrics transcriptions and it's it's a time saver to have foot pedals to be able to do this stuff uh, people do this nowadays actually in music using foot pedals to control iPads or screens if they're playing the piano or playing a musical composition so that's kind of it on YouTube I just wanted to show you what's available so my message to you on this is I'm not going to say that draft my message to you is one uh, the technology inside of YouTube is absolutely amazing and stunning with its accuracy too. You can go in right now and adjust the transcriptions, adjust the subtitling, the captioning, and uh, it makes it more accurate and easier for immersive readers to read it. So definitely have that due diligence when you go in and work with your YouTube titles if you use YouTube. If you use Canvas Studio, Canvas Studio also has captioning. I'm not going to show you that today. And then so does Zoom. And then Zoom is pretty cool. As you see here on my graphic, with Zoom, you can do live transcription. If you have anyone that's super fast, able to type super duper fast, you could do that. You could also bring in a third-party service. Captioning also is available inside of Zoom automatically, not unlike the technology in YouTube. So there's a lot of great technology out there. Canvas Studio does a good job as well. So take advantage of all of that for sure. Let me maybe jump to, we'll do Canvas, but let me jump to other technology. I wanted to mention some of these. So check out Google Chrome and the various immersive readers available for you. So if you have Chrome, let me just load up Chrome and I probably in all honesty should be using it more than Safari. I, I think I have Safari as my default browser. Google Chrome has quite a few accessibility tools that you can use. Here's Dr. Fauci and the latest COVID-19 forecast. I know our masks are going down. Um, if you still see me with a mask on campus, by the way, I have uh, lived with someone immunocompromised. And so um, I'm going to be wearing my mask into the future. And I may actually wear it way into the future because I realized talking to a friend that um, it's kind of cool not having a cold for two years. You know, I don't like the pandemic, but not breathing in some of that stuff, those pollutants, particularly on an airplane, is is kind of nice not, not getting sick. So if you see me with a mask... Um, it's uh, definitely one of the reasons that I'm wearing it, or there are a few reasons why, why, I'm, why, why I'm wearing the mask. The other thing I wanted to say about that is I was talking to some of our world language instructors, and it's been so hard for our ASL instructors and students to work during COVID, um, oftentimes because they have to do things on Zoom. Or imagine being in an in-person class, if you put a mask on, you're losing all that nuance that happens through ASL, right? Through facial expressions and so forth. So it's it's amazing to think about how the pandemic has had an impact on persons with disabilities and on accessibility challenges. So if I go to Google Chrome, these are where I have all my extensions. And you can just click on your extension manager here on Google Chrome. This will tell you everything that you have here. If it's uh, on or off, it's your pin is blue or not. The helper bird, by the way, is available. Talk to Kelly, Nicole, or Beth in the SAS. In SAS, I keep saying the. I'm going to stop it, I promise. By the end of this video, I'm going to say it 100 times. So in SAS, not the SAS. And they will get you set up with helper bird. It's a way to really transform your browser and what you see on the screen in terms of heading size, um, all this kind of amazing stuff. I think if I double click it, it'll show you all the quick actions. Reader mode, immersive reader. New note, extract text, OCR, website to reading list, screenshot, shortcuts, voice typing, word prediction, summarize page, translation. I mean, this has just about everything, PDF reader. So this is really your one-stop shop for anything accessibility 
that you might see on the internet. And check this out. You can change the background color. You can alter the uh, links color. That you can make this whatever you want it to be. Your notes, all the animations, the OCR preferences, and so forth. Kelly, by the way, did a really good overview of this at one of our all, all faculty days. Um, I wish we had recorded that. I think we need to record more of those, but um, it, maybe we can have her do that again because I think it's really great for you to see this on screen as it's actually happening. You can't really describe this. I'm not going to go through it all, but maybe we can set something like that up again. I'd love for us to do one or more accessibility-related teaching talks or workshops every single quarter because, again, we have to really send the message as a college I'm going to work harder, all of you work harder too, that this is not an option. It's something we absolutely must do. It's a moral charge that we must take to make sure all our content is accessible for all of our students. So I love Helperbird. The other thing I'm going to show you here under Extensions Manager is this, it was here, now it um, absolutely disappeared on me. Um, it's the Immersive Reader. It should be showing up on one of these panes up here, but let's try something else. What we could do is, let me just go back to say Yahoo, and let me some, select some text because the helper bird will do the same thing for us. So I'm just going to select that, right click it. It could vary on your mouse how this hap happens. Um, I use my trackpad and hit two fingers, and I'm going to click helper bird, and I'm going to view it in the immersive reader. Okay, and let's see what happens. Hmm, okay, interesting. For some reason, does it take a second to load? Okay. Huh. I didn't see anything happen. Did you hear anything? I didn't hear anything. Um, let me try something else. Text to speech. Dr. Anthony Fossey, the president's chief medical advisor, discussed what the U.S. could see in coming weeks amid the rise of the BA.2 variant and the likelihood of a surge this fall. By the way, if you're working with any text-to-speech technologies. One of the things I like is you can change voices now, and I use some of these voices in musical compositions, and some of them out there right now with the artificial intelligence and machine learning stuff going on, they will blow you away. I mean, they are so realistic. Like with deep fakes, unfortunately, you could probably trick people into thinking. They actually did this with Andy Warhol in the most recent uh, new series on Andy Warhol's life on Netflix, and uh, it's crazy to think that you could reproduce someone's voice from, you know, basically nothing, you know, taking text and transforming that into voice. It's just, just amazing. So the other thing you could do with Helper Bird is you could click on those other choices, annotation, what's the reader mode? Again, I'm not an expert on this, but this I think will show you things broken down into bigger chunks. But this is kind of interesting because on this, it's showing me a lot of the ads. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about with alt text is, Unfortunately, even with the technology that we have now that's super amazing, sometimes you see something like this and it actually doesn't have the Fauci text here. So it's talking about something else and maybe that's just a later story. One of the challenges with using any of this technology is sometimes it doesn't always get it right. And we're concerned, of course, because sometimes a student isn't able then to access this. So let me leave the helper bird and the immersive reader stuff alone. I'm not an expert in its use. I'd rather that folks at SAS, I did the the again, take you through this because I think it's it's really um, important that we learn um, all that technology. So immersive reader I have on here, Google Chrome, and of course helper bird, which is what we uh, heard that presentation on at All Faculty Day. So now let's talk a little bit about what happens inside of Canvas. Again, Michael McGall will be presenting on this at Teaching Talk 69 along with Kelly. So definitely check out all that information that you gain at that teaching talk. We're gonna log on to Canvas here. And this is going to be, by the way, the very quick overview of this. So you just know kind of some of the technologies out there. So I'm just gonna to go to one of my sandbox classes and I'll show you a few, a few of the features that are available. So if I choose a text page, let's just find one here, Canvas intro. I think there's some text there. Indeed there is. So one of the things I'm going to notice is that at the top I have something called immersive reader. So if I just play this and hit play at the bottom. Canvas intro. This class uses basic features of Canvas to organize course content. The home page is set to the course modules which introduce each week's reading, objectives, and assignments like discussions and exams. 
The syllabus page contains the PDF of the class syllabus as well as a list of each assignment and its due dates. That's actually really good, you know, listening to that. These are the voice settings. You can adjust the speed, faster or slower. You can also access class tasks directly by clicking on discussions for discussions, quizzes for exam one and two, or assignments for a list of everything. Okay, do that a little bit and you will go mad here and get that fast. You can choose male or female. You kind of get the idea. Everything. It will also be important to stay up to date with announcements. So I probably, yeah, I probably want to keep that as a user fairly slow, more in the turtle than the hair. That's actually pretty cool. You have the text, the speech up here. You can adjust the text size. So you can make it larger or smaller. You can adjust, adjust the colors. So you can choose your contrast. We have all this adaptive technology right now in our screens, in our iPhones, dark mode and so forth. If you play Wordle, you can choose between the light mode and the dark mode. It's really great because a lot of us struggle as we get into our 50s with readers and glasses and not having, and I've had these off actually because I, I do better with this size a little bit with not my glasses, uh, not wearing the glasses. But you can choose all the colors that you want. You can choose the font. I don't know anyone that would choose Comic Sans. If you choose Comic Sans, I think, um, is it, what, what plane of hell that Dante talks about is for those who use Comic Sans, the eighth plane of hell. I'm just kidding, I'm joking, but uh, tell you, I, I could tell you some stories about, um, K-12 experiences people using Comic Sans too much. Actually, people use Comic Sans in a lot of places. Anyway, I digress. You can see the options here uh, for parts of speech. And if I click that, what's very cool is all my nouns are going to be purple. All my verbs will be red. And check that out. Look, look how accurate that is. I'm amazed by this. And if you think it's not amazing, look at the complexity of any language. I mean, I'll tell you, the fact that... that Technology can figure out an adjective from an adverb. Um, I, I heard a story about a certain creative writing professor once at UC Riverside. He talked about people avoiding adverbs in their creative writing. So if that's true, you could go through here. Actually, any of us could use this. Even if we don't need this adaptive technology, you could look at, okay, directly. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these and maybe they're not all adverbs. And then you can choose whether or not the labels are shown, which will add the additional feature of adjective, noun, verb, etc. And then you can also look at these reading preferences, the live focus mode, which is really cool. So as you're reading, um, I think as I hit play, it's going to go along with that, right? Let's try that. Reminders and other important class. Yeah, so that's that focus mode that you can use. And if I exit out of that, um, actually, that was full screen. I haven't used this a ton, actually. So I think if I want to get out of focus mode or change any of this, I think now these are going to be the the settings. Okay, that'll let me play that one, that that verb. And I'm not sure with the picture dictionary. It takes you to board maker. I, I'd have to, to check that out. You can also do translation. You can translate it into Afrikaans if you wanted to, or any language. So that could be useful for all of our language classes, if that's something you want students to use. So a lot of really cool options there. I'm going to try to yeah, click those all off. And then I'm going to go back to my uh, theme, which is, well, now that looks so bright. But yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. And look at this. It has the links, too. So it's, it's really nice how it highlights the links. So if I, if I leave Immersive Reader, if I just go back to my main page, you can see what it looks like without that. So that has absolutely everything, really, um, in one place. Again, Helper Bird is also available. So it's nice having redundancy if we want to use more than one technology. Now check this out. When I hit the Edit page, you're going to see a new accessibility thing pop up. And that's going to be on the right bottom here. And it uh, looks like a little, is that a P or something or an A? Um, this is one of our uh, Pope Tech accessibility checkers. So the other one is giving you like uh, text-to-speech and immersive opportunities to reorient like Helper Bird, what the text looks like to change the contrast, the colors, etc. This one is really intended for the instructor. Now, one thing that's a little confusing is you're going to see a little dude there. I think that's a dude called accessibility checker. It's a different accessibility checker. And actually, in this case, it said no issues were found. I get the balloons. With the what I think Michael McGall has said is the better one, and I'll let him speak to this specifically, it's by Pope Tech. And I heard that the Chancellor's Office prefers this one. What it will tell you is any error needs to be fixed. So the heading, 
no heading structure. And it says here, the page has no headers. Provide a clear, consistent header structure. Canvas adds the header one for you as the page title. Add any header level two and subheadings as needed. I guess I could see in some cases that you maybe wouldn't have, if you had just one line of text, you wouldn't have multiple subheads like you see in a book sometimes with different sections and so forth. Again, this is why I really say like, there are no gotcha moments, I believe, in accessibility. Um, it's about really learning the stuff and making sure we know what we're doing. But the reason there are no gotcha moments is one, we want to be kind to each other and not turn this into a game where we say, you missed one and I'm going to shame you or something like that. No, in fact, what we want to do is say, let's work with each other, let's collaborate as professional colleagues and really do the due diligence that we all need to, to take and undertake to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. But secondly, we have to really make sure that we don't get so prescriptive and say, for my class, it's this way, it has to be this way for your class. I don't have equations or tables. Rarely I have tables. For those of you that teach math or statistics and you have a ton of tables and you have headers and thinking about the relationships between rows and columns, it's a much different beast to deal with than what I'm dealing with with text or images, which can also be challenging or videos. So I say this because there's no one size fits all opportunity to fix your class. There are some best practices. There are technologies we can all learn. But I love PopeTech because I think it's one of those that shows you very clearly what's wrong, what needs to be fixed. If you have any video issues, HTML, images and links, it'll tell you if you don't have your alt text and so forth. So check that out. If you want to do it again, after you change something, you can hit the rescan button and it'll give you your results. So that one I think is really good. And I think it's more full fledged. Whereas this one I found maybe like Michael has, it doesn't highlight that much and it's not super helpful maybe when it uh, does the check. So that's, I think the main thing you're going to discover when you're working with Canvas is stuff like that, that you want to either have the option to go into the immersive mode as we saw if we get out of the edit page. And then back in the edit page, we want to be able to make sure that our content is accessible. So I think that's all I have to say about Canvas right now. Again, there are other best practices. We're going to get some of those to some of those rather in our discussions this week and into the future. But one of those I might um, talk about under my resources section here as we look at some resources is there's quite a bit of information out there. I wish these were linked. Sorry, I'm just going to double click this and have to do it the old fashioned way. So these are the links and resources I have available for you this week. Again, please add to this if you want more added. Uh, let me know and I can add these resources to the video. So these are all the different um, tips out there about what types of disabilities exist with students. The next thing is our poker process, and we're going to be talking about that. I know we're constituting or reconstituting poker teams. In our entire poker process, we have this whole accessibility check. So if you want to check out the poker accessibility toolkit, this has a lot of stuff that you need to know. Checker tools, Pope Tech, again, fully free. Uh, you do it here. I, th I think we're maybe getting away from using you do it. Useful resources and course design. This is that section D in our poker process where we go through and make sure that we have all the accessibility checks completed and that all our content is indeed accessible. I have the link to SAS, which we looked at. We're going to talk about alt text in a second, and those are the, the additional links. So check out all those links, uh, if you will, on, on Canvas. Then we can, I think, really create some amazing resources. We'd love to do more with um, adding more on accessibility to our website. And I know a lot of you, if it's not your job to do accessibility, it's really hard for you to create your own resources, even for your part-time faculty. So I would love to do that in conjunction with SAS to make sure that we have everything that we need as instructors to help our students. And by the way, counseling faculty as well, whatever help that you need in your services, let me know if I can facilitate anything. I'd be happy to uh, help make some of that happen. So let's talk about alt text now. Okay, so to get started with alt text, I can insert an image. And let me see, I thought maybe, I'm just going to maybe try this unsplash. I haven't tried it. Let me type in anthropology. What I'm curious about is, does it include the alt text for you? Okay, cool. So here is a statue. And let me put that in there. 
Let me hit submit. Okay, so it's inserted this public graphic here. The minute you click back on your image, if you didn't put in your alt text, that's where you can click image options. And then this is your alt text option. And check that out. Very cool. It has the alt text put in. Grace concrete statue of man sitting on gray concrete bench. So what it's trying to do there is be somewhat descriptive about what it sees. And I, by the way, find all the stuff with alt text to be very intriguing because a computer is figuring out based on doing visual analysis what the heck is in the image. I don't know if you think that's amazing. I think it's phenomenal. And I'm going to show you some in a bit here that PowerPoint does, which is really astonishing as well. It can figure out like indoor versus outdoor. It can figure out if something's a bus. It can figure out if a room is cluttered. And if you looked around here, yeah, this room is really cluttered. If I took a photo of this and threw it on PowerPoint, I would love to see that because it would probably say really cluttered, messy office with a ton of technology. I bet it's what... I, Probably that's what it would say, I don't know. But that's that's phenomenal. So this is cool, so check that out. It has actually put in the alt text for us. Now again, do not assume if machine learning determines your alt text that that is the correct alt text. You really have to think about this. And to that end, let me show you some really intriguing research. Check this out. If I go to Microsoft and I Look at some of this research. This will actually tell you everything you need to know about alt text. Here's what it means. Here's a recommended alt text. Here's another one. So this is kind of interesting. It's like saying one, two sentences recommended versus this one, a photo. Um, if another one said a photo of two phones, two phones on the table, the phone on the right has a wider screen. The phone on the left has a higher quality camera. So that's really interesting. So if someone is blind, how much detail do you give? And this is one of these fascinating, like linguistic, sensory kind of philosophical conundrums. Because if you think about any object out there, right, like this object right here, this is a Harris Harvey's glass. Um, and I had an ex that used to work at Harris and Harvey's and we got these. I think they were, hopefully they were, they were giveaways. Anyway, we got a bunch of these, still have them many years later. And so the interesting thing about this is if you describe this as vessel holding liquid, that is a terrible alt text because it could be a gasoline can. A gasoline can with gasoline is a lot different than a Harris Harvey's glass with water. Now here's where it comes in where I show my ignorance or lack of knowledge about uh, technology, adaptive technology for the blind. My question would be this, and someone please, this is a dialogue, put it in my comments or let's chat in my office. Would you need to know here, if I said glass, I couldn't just say glass, right? Because it could be a glass window. Um, someone that replaces glass, right? Works with glass. So I would say a glass cup, uh, I guess glass cup uh, would be better than glass vessel because glass vessel could be a vase or something like that. If I just said glass again, you might think, yeah, I know what that is, but what about glasses? And we don't typically think of glasses in the singular sense, right? Different meaning. But again, these all involve glass. A lot of glass in our environment. So I would think it'd have to be something like, a, a, you know, a glass vessel or a glass stein. You know, would stein make sense to people? Stein is kind of a little more archaic or lesser used word for a type of glass. And then do I need to know that it's a glass that's transparent or clear? Do I need to know that there's a flag on one side, Harris and Harvey's logo, a star here as well. The bottom of it actually says Budweiser and it has more information. When in archaeology, we do analysis of lithics, when you do what's called typology, and check out, um, talk to Jennifer and Melinda Button, who could talk to you way more about this, or two of our great anthropology instructors. But we often get into those level of detail. So I remember doing a late Mississippian archaeological dig on the Ohio River back in the day when I was way younger, in the uh, early 90s. And when we did analysis of stone tools or ceramics, we were actually getting into every single detail. If we had what's called a pot shard, we were actually looking at the material, the shape of it, decomposition, anything that might have happened through what we call bioturbation in the ground, you know, worms and insects and critters affecting stuff and maybe changing the appearance of it. So if you do material cultural analysis of the sort of archaeologists that they're engaged in, you would want all that detail. And I say this not to be super philosophical or archaeological, but the truth is alt text is not a simple matter. And I wish it was as simple as you go in and you type a word or two. I really encourage you to think of this again as a process and an understanding and an unraveling that is both philosophical, practical, and pedagogical and technological at the same time. So check this information out. 
talking about diagrams, flow charts, when not to use alt text. If it's a decorative object, you wouldn't use it. And, and if we go back to Canvas, you'll see that there is that option right inside of Canvas. So if this is a decorative image, which it's not, and I think that's generally fairly objective, then I could click this and then that's grayed out. So then the reader is not going to pick that up because it's maybe not um, necessary. Kind of interesting though, because you'd think like, wouldn't it be our goal to create for the blind student the exact experience translating from one modality of uh, visual text to a sensory modality of the auditory channel as we're hearing something being spoken to us or described to us. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about, again, philosophically, what to include or not to include. Let me show you a few more, a few more examples. This is uh, further kind of exemplifying, I think, the challenges of alt text because it's not as simple as just typing a few words in. Here's how to write alt text and, and why it matters. And again, if you're getting into charts or graphics, there are different ways to think about things. You can do this within the world of code. If you, if you do CMS, which probably most people do, or do not, sorry, do not do, um, you could look at this. These are good and bad examples. So the bad alt text written as a HTML code, and then the good one. And by the way, if you look at that ALT, if you look at that very sensible code there, you can see this if you go to your HTML browser. And if you ever want to talk about HTML, I'm sure many folks out there would, would love to talk to you about it, those of us that have, have used it in the past. So check this out. I'm going to leave in, it's not decorative, I'm going to leave in gray concrete statue. Okay, and I'm going to hit save on that. Now I can go to my HTML browser, which you know is available on the edit page. And it's just going to be at the bottom of your rich content editor. Just click that right there. And this is where I get all my HTML write-up language. And this is where you see, let me find it here. There's so much information on the screen where we're going to get our actual alt text. It's right here. Okay. So it's this line of code. So if you ever want to do that, all you'd have to do is copy this format. And that's the, the cool thing about HTML is it's very clear if you've done any in the old days, Fortran or basic language, languages that maybe are still taught, but kind of archaic languages, computing languages of the 80s that I remember learning as, as a younger person. But it's very sensible here. You see ALT equals sign and then a quote, and that is that string of text and then an end quote. So that is what defines at the level of coding inside the black box, if you will, that when this image is viewed and read by a reader, that it actually then will have that alt text read out loud to a, uh, a visually impaired student or anyone who's who's reading or looking at that, that image. So again, just if you're ever curious about that, click on the HTML editor and that will immediately take you to that. And it just kind of shows you what's going on behind the scenes in at the level of HTML. So I, I think that's pretty cool to know. Handy tip there. Here is Harvard's guide to alt text. I'll put that in for you. And if you're curious about any of this, just type like alt text challenges. That's what I type. Because when I started thinking about this issue this week, I'm like, is it as simple as typing a few words to go over your image? And then I discovered it's actually not, right? And that, that's the challenge of this. I think part of what we do in working with students with disabilities and providing accessibility services that are meaningful and powerful at the college is understanding what the needs are. We'll talk about that at the end with my little bit on perspective. Secondly, knowing all the resources, the help, the folks at SAS and other places that can assist you. And then having perspective about it, knowing what you need to do, but how to do that in your class. I wish it were something as easy as a plug and play option. Like you get an app and it does everything for you. It transforms everything for you. It really doesn't. There aren't, often aren't a lot of shortcuts for that. Now, again, it's cool that if you put in a stock image, it at least has that stock alt text, you can decide how much you want to alter that on your own. So this is from Harvard's Accessibility Center, writing alt text, good and bad alt text, alt text with no context, a mostly empty stadium, right? It was just like, like my glass example. I didn't give you enough context to know what this really is. My question is, for the experts out there, again, let me know, because I'm not an expert on this, is do I ever give too much context? for an alt text, like saying everything about this glass, including it says Budweiser on the bottom. And it takes me back to the lithic days as a student in archeology, span thinking about this stuff and it's, it's super fascinating. Here's alt text uh, that says here, Harvard Stadium with two lone runners bounding up the steps, Harvard Stadium with cracked concrete pillars. 
complex image types. So I think what they're trying to really indicate here is that there's either maybe too much context or not enough context, and you shouldn't uh, include photo of or image of. You should leave it blank if it's if it's purely directive. And you don't have to add it if there's a title field there. You don't have to add that in the title field. So this is kind of, I think, good information. There are testing tools here available. I haven't tried these out, but a lot of these are cool. You know, I'm probably going to add, maybe I should add this to our list because the testing tools might be really cool. Wave accessibility, um, Axe development tools, accessibility insights for web, Andy, name and description, uh, inspector. So you might want to check check these out. This has more on color contrast. Again, Helper Bird might, might do some of this as well. PDF accessibility checker. You know, it just reminds me, I didn't really get into PDF accessibility. I think we'll save that. But that's probably been an issue in some of our Canvas classes. So let's um, come back to that at a future date because it occurs to me that some of us put PDFs up in our class. And if they are image-based PDFs versus OCR ones, then we get into issues. What I hope you can do is take helper bird, pull up your PDF, and maybe transform that into an OCR version. So let's let's uh, put that on the to-do list. In fact, let me make a little thing here. This is, by the way, why I do these trainings and I do these uh, kind of graphic layouts is because I feel like sometimes I'm going to forget something and then I discover it and I throw it up in the chat if it's a workshop or I will throw it on my outline. So let me leave that under Canvas because I know we use a lot of PDF and and we, we probably do need to check on that in, in the future. Let me show you one last alt text resource you can check, check out and this is alt text challenges it's called and this is from Michigan State and this really got to the discipline level and this is why I was just trying to encourage us to think this week about how accessibility is not a right or wrong thing in the sense of the alt text because in some disciplines it may mean something different and this is what happens is so we know what alt text is but then as you get into neuroscience versus teaching and learning versus food safety molecular genetics finance classic studies you get into new issues so this one here in romance and classical studies says I teach French and teaching methods for foreign language training. The main dilemma is the current methods encourage us to use visuals to present the meaning of new vocabulary and avoid the use of English in translations. When teaching grammar, we highlight endings or whatever grammar point we're teaching such that we can make it salient for our students to figure out grammatical rules on their own. Um, using alt text may go against the method we use. I'm not sure how to reconcile this. So what I think would be really cool for like an all faculty day or convocation or, or another teaching talk is we actually do something where we model this. We have each of us from our different disciplines. We have someone from mathematics. We have someone from foreign language. We have someone from anthropology, someone from PE. They all put up their examples of working with accessibility. It could be alt text. It could be something in Canvas. It could be something about a physical space of a classroom. And then maybe a person in another discipline like they did here responds to that. Because again, we have to avoid this notion. I, I love templates in Canvas and stuff. But if we get too template crazy, if we get too prescriptive in what we provide to you, and this is one of the reasons I'm never prescriptive in the instructions I give to you. Because again, I want to be gracious. And I also want to acknowledge that you teach a different discipline for me. If you're Bruce or Larry or Wynn or Steve, or anyone in mathematics, and you're doing a lot with equations, you have a challenge there that I've never had, other than one or two equations, maybe in a physical anthro class or archaeology class, but nothing like what you guys deal with in dealing with complex mathematical operations. So I just want to say that because I think, you know, this kind of exercise could be really useful at the college. So maybe if that's something that interests you, reach out to your dean, reach out to me. Maybe we can make something like that happen. Because again, alt text, super important topic, but I wish it were so easy as getting one sentence or one word to throw in there to, um, you know, solve the issue there. So a lot really, I think, to learn about with alt text this week and, and certainly more to come as we uh, go on uh, in the future. Now, let me show you one other thing, and I'll just mention that Twitter is now doing alt text. If you want to check that out, go to Twitter. There should be a, a beta coming out where you would click um, on the image as you're posting it. And in the right bottom quarter, I believe in gray, it'll say ALT in the box. And that's where you, you put your alt text uh, indicator. And I think it's something great that is going on in the world of Twitter and social media because I think there's been a, maybe a lack of awareness of that need. 
And if it's being addressed in social media, then hopefully it will further emphasize what we're doing in the world of, of education. But again, this is more, I'm gonna show you these images in a second on my little section on perspective of this memory care facility. I just wanted to see what this would do. So I, I dragged an image into PowerPoint. You, you can try this out. The minute you drag it in, it put the, it's, it's going to put the alt text in. So one of the things you could do is you could even copy this alt text. So check this out. It, the computer machine language correctly identified a picture containing indoor floor, ceiling, and room. So it knows that it's indoors, totally accurate. It, there's a floor here, there's a ceiling, and there's what's defined as a room. And I, I just find that amazing that it knows this kind of information. This is one here, a picture, a, a picture containing text, outdoor, truck, and loaded. So this is pretty fascinating. I'm wondering if the machine language figures out trees and sky, right? It could be by color, it could be the hex, uh, number or whatever you call the Pantone number that figures out of the color. I don't know how it does this, but it's pretty amazing. It knows it's outdoors. It knows it's a truck. It's technically a truck, right? This is one of those loaders that goes onto, uh, this is, I'll, I'll talk about this. This is cleaning out a family member's home uh, back in the day in, in Indiana. And it, it notates that it's loaded. So it knows that it's loaded. It didn't say messy, which I think is interesting because one of the, the next images on here, I think, said messy. I think I missed that one. And this next one says a picture containing text and indoor. And this is actually inside a car dealership. So unfortunately, it didn't get the chairs. It didn't, it, it figured out indoor. It figured out text, which I've covered some of this up for confidentiality. It didn't get, it got the text. It knew that there's text. It didn't figure out car. It didn't figure out chair. This reminds me of those uh, uh, CAPTCHA thing that, that you click on when you're on a website to make sure you're not a robot. Identify all the squares with um, a car or a chair or something like that. So this one wasn't super accurate. Again, machine language is allowing some of this to happen, some of it doesn't. This is another one. It was really accurate. A picture containing text, indoor, office, cluttered. This is actually a garage, but I think it got office because there are like boxes here. I'm, I'm really fascinated. I, I, you know, this is a microwave box and then it says cluttered. So it's able to visually figure out that this space is dense. And I find that absolutely amazing that it can determine this. So again, use alt text. It's, it's super, super important. But the fact that you have all these technological opportunities out there for you to take advantage of, I think is super, it's, it's absolutely helpful, and I think it's something that we all need to absolutely just take advantage of in, in the future. And one last thing today to talk about in terms of alt text, and by the way, we've really only covered the surface on any of these issues, so don't think about this video as the final tutorial, if you will, about student accessibility technology, services, opportunities out there for all of us. Think of this as an introduction to this particular theme week, and then we can sort of branch out on any of these topics for teaching talks or workshops or services offered and trainings through SAS. But I wanted to mention one more thing with um, alt text. And so I know that there was a conversation about this as to whether or not these buttons are um, accessible inside a table. Um, indeed, these are actually accessible. So one of the things I'm gonna show you here is how you can think about accessibility very specific to these types of buttons or images. So again, this is presented to you in Canvas Commons if you wanna check it out or use it. As far as using this page, what you would go in and do once you import it in your class is hit the edit button and then at this point, you can add things, you can delete. Again, this is not like obviously your final page. And so the intention is you would fill in sections that have you know, text missing and so forth. You can delete these as you like. Go in and on your images, you can always decide if it's a decorative image, click decorative image. I actually thought this is kind of a judgment call. The one in the top, I thought it would be good to have the alt text. So welcome to our class. This is an image of Lake Tahoe, okay? Now again, I don't want to be prescriptive and say that that's the alt text you need to have, right? Like it's like with anything else in your class, you have to decide given the image, given, given how you're using it. I want to say the same thing about tables. So obviously those of you that use data tables want to carefully think about accessibility. This is not a data table. So in the case of a data table, you're going to have rows and columns. And anytime you're in a data table, like a spreadsheet in Excel or Google Sheets, there are relationships between 
headers between rows and columns. Obviously, if there's a relationship between row one and column one, that's something that you're gonna have to really think about in terms of accessibility. I can't speak to that because I don't use numerical or data tables in my classes. For those of you that do, in sociology, in mathematics, statistics, in the sciences, then really you need to speak um, to these issues. So um, keep in touch and we can talk about them. So the other thing I wanna show you is when you go in to do these, if you wanna use these buttons, by the way, you could take any of the buttons, you could copy it with your keyboard, you could move that to outside the table, and sometimes I struggle, no, it's working now, okay, and that would be here. Now, if you do a second button, what's kind of nice about that is it'll appear, just because of how I designed these, it'll appear without the line there, and that actually could be maybe more interesting for you if you want something like that that's more seamless. The idea is you would have different buttons here. So what I like about this is these are actually then pretty seamless. You could just have this across your page, hit return until you have the number that you want. So again, by putting this in there, um, I think there was a mistaken assumption that I was saying you must use it in a table. Um, so just to clarify, if I send you resources, adapt those resources. So this is the whole point of open source culture. It's not about like the person that creates it is being dogmatic about how to use it. Absolutely not. So check this out. When you go ahead and put your alt tags in, you could go up here and if this is the one you want, just type syllabus, okay? And then for any of those, once you do that, you can hit done and I'll save this. And so now let's go to our immersive reader. So I just wanna illustrate here that the placement of these objects inside of a table does not affect their ability to be read by the immersive reader. And you know, there may be standards out there and this is the challenge of accessibility. So someone might have a link, for example, that says, certain organizations recommend we not use tables. If that's the case, again, you can make that judgment call and certainly talk to Beth and Kelly in the, uh, not the DRC, in the SAS, and see what they have to say about that. But one way around that, let's say that's the case. Your backup is, you could put the image down here and paste them across here. So there isn't like an accessibility conundrum here that we have to deal with other than your own decision as an instructor via academic freedom. How do you wanna handle the decisions about how to create the resources here in your Canvas class. So what we would do now just to check this out is, we'll just click on Immersive Reader. If you're using Helperbird, you could use that for the Immersive Reader part. You know, it just depends on what is being used by the student or by you. So as I start this, you see it's actually going to read the alt text that is in the table. So the table does not affect the immersive reader, nor does you know having an Im image affect an immersive reader. Because what's going on behind the scenes, like in my discussion earlier of HTML, is if I hit edit here and hit HTML, you're going to see that all that write-up actually is really what matters. Like we see something, but via the black box, we don't see the work behind it. So every time we have an alt here as our HTML co code, that is giving a message to the immersive reader that that is that information and thus it's read. And the only thing you're going to see in a, at the HTML level to see that the table is here are these style headers here, right? Again, these tags indicate via the black box that that is a table. But there's nothing in an immersive reader that once it hits the HTML write-up language that tells it it's a table that it can't read that. So that, again, I really wanna clarify that and I don't want like misinformation out there because that is not good. Um, so let's just, you know, coordinate. If you have um, ideas or information maybe, let's coordinate via my position before we send out any of that information because I think it's going to really potentially confuse people out there. So let's hit Immersive Reader and see what happens here. What you're going to be seeing here is really just the text, right? So the Immersive Reader takes all that imagery out of it and it's just inserting, I think it's probably doing this by just stripping out the HTML write-up. So in other words, it's stripping out any information that tells our processor here via the web, via Canvas, to display an image. Instead, it just displays text, headings, and then you're gonna see your alt text here. I didn't create these for these other images, and that's why obviously we do wanna change those before we put those in our class, because then if a student sees one or hears one point JPEG, then that's not gonna make any sense. Well, let's start at the top and hear how this sounds. Master page set one. Welcome to our class. 
This is an image of Lake Tahoe. Welcome to XXXX. Greetings. Hello. I'm your professor, XXXX. Syllabus. Getting started. Frequently asked questions. So you get the idea and it's reading that quite slow because you'll recall we can go in and decide on our preferences um, everything that we want ranging from you know text size to the speed of the reading here. We could go slower, faster, choose the voice selection. So that's good news. So you know we know that it's accessible. Again, the extent to which you use this in your class, how you create your alt text, whether you use tables or not for images, whether you use just standard sort of images without tables is totally up to you. Well, one of the things that I do in this also just to make it easier for me is just to present this to you as a table. And, and again, these are, are being really small. You're not going to see that in the Canvas um, Commons version. But when you go to use this in your class, actually, um, it's a little harder. And believe me, I've done this millions of times working with graphics and creating websites and everything. If I present this to you like this and I just copy them, it's actually not as easy as a user just to define and find exactly where the image is and then use it, delete it, add it. And so it makes a lot of practical sense to give you, imagine if you're going to the store and all your spices were mixed together and you're trying to create a recipe, you want your spices to be separate in separate containers. So think of these as the spices that you can use to cook whatever dish you're making. Thus, one of the other reasons I include this in a table is to easily, easily uh, provide it to you and then you can cut and paste it from here and use it how you want. So by, by no means, uh, if you get it as a table, do you have to use it as a table? By no means, if you get it, should you assume it's a finished product? Obviously, you gotta change that. You gotta go in and do your alt text. You gotta decide if you want this banner image or not or delete it. And then you need to go in here and decide which of these to include. Not all of you maybe have um, and FAQs. Not all of you maybe have office hours if you're part-time and you're not paid for office hours. So this is all about adaptability and I will certainly work in the future on communicating that and I think if you have any questions get back to me because one thing we want to do is just avoid a lot of weird confusion going on when people are maybe assuming what these resources are about, how they're used, the rhyme and reason behind them, and I'm really the person to to answer those questions because I'm the one who created it. So a little bit of confusion this week, but I think we're good right now. I think maybe you have an un understanding of how these can be used, about how alt text can be used, and all the aspects of providing these resources for you to use in your own classes. All right, so I know this has been a rather long video, but we've had so much to cover. So I wanna keep this last section fairly short and just talk a little bit about perspective. And so what I'm intending by this is really sort of indicating that I think one of our greatest challenges that we face in trying to understand students with disabilities and the accessibility needs that they have and all the efforts, including technology, human resources, trainings, um, communication, marketing that we need to send out to the world in various ways, all that kind of stuff kind of connects back to this issue of perspective. And it's something that I think about a lot as a cultural anthropologist. And so I'm sort of challenging us to say, let's see the world from the perspective of the person who has the disability. This makes me think almost of some of these dark restaurants that are pretty popular in Germany. And the dark restaurant is basically what it says. So you wear a blindfold and you eat your meal entirely blindfolded. And so it can have a number of different impacts on you. It could certainly encourage you to think more about your taste sense than your visual sense. And of course, visual sense is a key part of food. So we realize that in our uses of the senses, a lot of them play off of one another in various like integrative ways. The other thing a dark restaurant can really encourage us to do is to try to see the world from the perspective of someone without sight, someone who's blind. And very tricky, right? Because obviously you have to be careful about this. I know in various experiments to show people what it's like, for example, to use a wheelchair or a walker. 
that could go in a lot of different directions and it could potentially be offensive to the person involved, uh, the person with the disability or the person needing accessibility services. So we have to be very careful of that, but at the same time we do need to develop a perspective that takes into account the needs of people that might be very different from our needs. Same thing with race and equity. If we're a straight, white, male, cis person teaching a class and we have a student in our class from an entirely different demographic, ethnic, sexual, gender perspective, we have to really try to check our biases as we've been talking about for many years with our equity efforts and make sure that we could try to understand the perspective of the person experiencing what we need to address in the classroom, in student services and so forth. Now, of course, any anthropologist worth a darn would tell you, you can never fully experience the perspective of the person seeing the world different from yourself. What we would call in the old days the, the really bad idea of going native. Um, you would see these white guys studying Native Americans and they would become full-fledged members of a Na Native American tribe and wear the headdress and so forth. And uh, really offensive, of course, an example of cultural appropriation, which makes me think a little bit of Rachel Dozel, who is uh, profiled a number of years back on a new Netflix documentary. She was the woman that was the former chair of the NAACP position in Spokane, Washington. And she was a white woman and she took on the identity of an African-American woman and to this day claims that she is African-American. So, you know, this perspective thing is very tricky. If you ever want to talk about this with me, I'd love to give you my, you know, cultural anthropological takes on this. But here's what I want to offer. So I'll give you just a couple of brief indications of how I've experienced this. So a number of years ago, and I'm certainly still dealing with this, um, simultaneously at the same time in my life, I was dealing with a relative who has uh, since passed away from severe uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, at the same time dealing with another loved one who has a very uh, challenging malignant condition, uh, form of brain cancer called a glioblastoma multiform. And both of these things happened at the same time. And I discovered very quickly in addressing both in various ways, in more ways than I can even describe today. And if you're ever curious and you want to talk about challenging life circumstances, trauma like this, and how it's affected you and how, how you can adapt, please come down to my office or we'll set up a Zoom. I'd love to talk to you about it because, you know, I've experienced it probably as many of you have. Experiencing two situations like this at the same time was super challenging and what was relevant to this topic is both of these conditions result in severe cognitive disability such that you have to take on new techniques of communicating with the indi individuals involved. In fact, this is kind of a, a memory care facility, which is a big side of helping people with certain conditions, including Alzheimer's dementia. This is a picture from a hospital. Uh, UCSF with a loved one. And one of the things that happens when uh, doctors go in and remove and do what's called a resection, they remove the tumor from the brain. They basically suck it out during a really long five to six hour operation. And it's um, something obviously that re results in severe trauma after the fact. The particular tumor in this case was about the size of, of a baseball. And so when you pull something like that out, obviously it's going to have huge impact on the person's cognition. One of the things that's admirable is UCSF does an entire study involving graduate students where they study all aspects of language after a resection. So it involves visual language, as you see here, yes and no questions. I've preserved some of the privacy here of the loved one. And it also involves um, linguistic cues. It involves people trying to say certain things and phrases and so forth. And you get a sense of how severe this is one of the loved ones trying to write after the resection, uh, the surgery, and you can see how severe the impact on one's language is following um, a condition like this and the surgery. So, and this is just a shot of, of UCSF Hospital, which was kind of a moment of solitude as much as possible when you're going through all this and the recovery, which takes some um, almost up to a month when, when a person, depends on from person to person, but with a resection, a craniotomy, 
the impact on the brain and on the individual and the body is is massive. And a month is an, a low estimate of how long it takes to recover. Um, and the recovery is never full. And so what I learned in both these cases is not just new ways of communicating with people with a cognitive disorder, but I had to begin to see the world from their eyes. So I had to understand that something as simple as going to the store is not easy because you can't drive or you need a walker in and out of the car. Um, the whole process of even getting a disabled placard for the car was involved. And so all of these adaptations and things that happen in the aftermath of something very serious, like either of these two cognitive disabling conditions, Alzheimer's dementia and a glioblastoma, multiform, a GBM, really allowed me the opportunity just to see that we can never take for granted disability. We can never take for granted and assume that the life of the person that we are helping who has a disability, and believe me, in these times of cognitive peril because of trauma, post-COVID-19, and all the other stuff in our world, um, a lot of the disabilities I believe we will see, I'm not an expert in this, but I believe that we'll see more and more cognitive disabilities, including PTSD, which is a very de uh, debilitating uh, disability. And we have to just be prepared for that, you know, increase our services if need be, increase our awareness, be advocates for people who need accessibility accommodations, whatever it's going to take. And the other thing I'll tell you about perspective from the two experiences, never, never, never try to assume that your way of coping or helping or communicating or working with that person is going to be your way. So as an example, and I've spent a lot of times, a lot of time working with neurologists all over the place in the Midwest, California, Nevada, just as a, a caregiver and helping out loved ones. One of the things the neurologist will tell you is you cannot, if someone says something that's incongruent, let's say someone has Tourette's, which is a condition that may result in unexpected and uncontrollable verbal outbursts. If someone says or you know, has Tourette's and says something in, in your class, certainly you want to fully get the services from counseling, from student services, and from SAS. But don't ever assume that you can just use your perspective or your approach to communicating or working with that student because you're really not seeing things from the perspective of that person, what we call the emic or insider's perspective in anthropology. I really hope none of you go through situations like this, no doubt, given the world and illnesses and the mental state of the world, collective trauma and so forth. Some of you likely will in the future or have and currently are dealing with this. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. And again, as much as I can help you uh, cope and, and have conversations about this, come by my office, be happy to talk about this. But this is the most powerful thing I can, I think, say to you and urge you to do this week is really see the world from the person that we're helping. Do not try to assume that you can use your approaches or how you think or how you communicate or how you might do a math problem or write an English paragraph because you're not living in the shoes of that person. And believe me, seeing it closely but not directly from the perspective of someone who has Alzheimer's dementia or a GBM, I came to appreciate wholeheartedly um, that we can't make assumptions about people. We can't, of course, stereotype people and we certainly can't assume that our way of negotiating the world as someone who doesn't have a particular condition is going to work or even going to help the person in need. So that's all I'll say this week. I'll close on perspective and some of those uh, stories that are not pleasant stories, but I'll tell you the you know good side of this kind of using the blues tradition of Cornell West is that you know the good stuff and the bad stuff, combining those together, one of the things you realize in dealing with one and then two of these conditions and situations is you get better at it. You adapt, you learn how to navigate the world, you learn that what you have presented with you, even though it might seem unfair or hard or traumatic, is where you're at in the world in terms of your reality, and you have to adapt and, and move forward. So let's do all we can as a college. Let's do more. All of us this week, please take this challenge. Every one of you listening to this message in every single position at the college, you can always do more to help students with disabilities and do more in terms of increasing accessibility awareness, getting the word out about the technology, doing the trainings, reaching out to students who maybe don't know that they need help, and supporting our SAS and the amazing staff there and all the people on campus that work very closely with this issue. So thanks for listening this week. This is the start of a conversation, many more, and let's do this again and continue the conversation about accessibility here at Lake Tahoe Community College. 